me dance along. Welcome to Your Mac Life for <laughs> the voices in my head. Welcome to Your Mac Life for a Wednesday, May the 23rd, 23rd, show number 1175. I am your host, Sean King, joined as always by my beautiful wife, Melissa. Melissa, how are you? Hello, Sean. I'm wonderful. Folks who are watching the video, uh, whether you're listening in live or the archive, will notice that uh, it's just a head shot of Melissa tonight for some bizarre reason because it's Wednesday most likely the exact same setup we've used for months and months and months something won't work quick time 10 will not suddenly talk to the iPad so I can show video of my beautiful wife so unfortunately you're stuck with me my <laughs> I'll, we'll make the show really short this week so you don't have to look at me very often but you can still hear her <laughs> isn't that it doesn't sound like just fairies isn't that just a wonderful little Listen, doesn't that Shut just so, just the sound makes you happy, doesn't it? Listen, <laughs> See, look at that. No, look, and there's like 18 different sounds she makes. I'm stopping. I'm broken. No, no. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> Stop, you're embarrassing me. Come on. Are you sure you're done? I'm done. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm good. <laughs> Stop it. I'm good. You're not Come done. on, this is serious business. Serious business. Let's get on with on, this. On tonight's show, as always, we've got a good friend, Jim Downerple of The Loop at loopinsight.com. We're going to talk about uh, WWDC, uh, The Loop Bash, which is happening at the same time as WWDC. We'll talk about the importance of WWDC, both the gym personally, gym professionally, and the Macintosh community as a whole, and also the iOS community as a whole. Um what else was I going to say? What else was there? There was something else uh, with Jim. Uh, hang on, hang on. I got it right here. I got it right here. It's, it's all right there. Uh, oh, and Google Assistant. There's still a big stink. Oh, remember that Google demo I showed you of yes. Google calling up a restaurant? Yes. Even watching it, there were some things that just struck me as odd and weird. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Google may or may not have fudged that recording. Oh. Google may or may not have broken the law with that recording. Oh. Because you are not allowed to, in California, they, the law requires two-person authentication or two-person permission to record a phone conversation. So before you record a phone conversation, you must, by law, ask permission of the other person and let them know they are being recorded. Well, I would, I, when I watched it, I would have hoped those people were informed. I didn't even think but otherwise. But Google said they didn't tell the people they were talking to ahead of time that they were talking to a robot. Well, I or disagree that with they that. Informed them. So, mm -hmm. so there's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of other mm -hmm. things about that. So we'll talk about that. Um, and in our starting point for photography segment, we're talking about, got, you got to beat this into your head, kids. This is the single most important thing in photography. Melissa, it is... Sorry, you would. Uh, whoa, okay. You just asked me what is the single most important thing in photography. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. <gasps> oh my god, you guys! Uh, light. No. Know what you're taking a photograph of. No. Take your lens cap off. No. <laughs> uh, think about what you're taking a photograph of before you take it. No. The most important thing in photography. You're killing me. I'm so so. I you I utilize all the things that you have taught me. You just sprung that question on me. Oh, thank you. See, I told you Monty should be on the hill with the rope. Composition. Yes. Well, a lot of those things that I was describing, though, I was, was I composition. Was teasing. I was teasing you. Yes, you are correct. <clears throat> but um, we're going to talk more. I've got to, That's something that you've got to be drilled into your head so that it's automatic. So that when you think about what's the most important thing, composition overall. And there's a bunch of different aspects to composition we'll talk about in the starting yes. point for a segment. Um, I said this on Twitter. One of the downsides of uh, working from home is that when you get bored and or peckish, you can make what you want mm. food-wise. Make an explosion in the kitchen. And I have for quite some time now had a craving for my grandmother's um, ginger molasses cookies. My grandma, Grandma Smith, my grandmother on my stepmother's side, Grandma Smith we call her, wonderful lady, beautiful grandmother, 
perfect grandma made cookies and just was wonderful. She made these to the, I was ten first time I had her cookies, and to this day I can still taste Grandma Smith's cookies. They were so good, mm. so gingery, molassesy. Mm. Now it turns out I found this out from Doctor Eno. I lived in, when I was living in Portland. One of the reasons why the foods that we had when we were kids we can't replicate or taste different when we're adults because, and I did not know this, our taste buds actually change as we get older. I didn't know that. Yes, they do. That's one reason why you can hate something when you're a kid and love something as an adult. That's right. Well, they develop the same as your brain and all of it. I hated spinach as a kid. Love spinach now. now. Used to hate Brussels sprouts. Now, I like Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things that you have to be careful of when you go and try to recreate these old family recipes these old family memories is you got to be really careful to not have too much expectations. So I know I, so I knew I couldn't get grandma's cookies. Perfect. I mean, even if grandma made them, they might not taste the same. No, you know what I mean? That's right. Cause I was 10. That's right. You know, I looked at the world completely differently, <clears throat> mm-hmm. but anyway, so I'm, oh, I made cookies. Oh my oh God. Oh my God. They are amazing. These are so good. These are just the, the, the well, best. Monty thinks you have her recipe. You don't have her recipe. No, do I, don't, you? I, don't, I don't. I don't. No. I'd have no. Idea. Grandma was a typical grandma. She did. You couldn't. You could ask her the recipe. She wouldn't have a clue what it was. She yeah. couldn't. She couldn't tell you what she what she did. Yes. She just did right. it. Yes. Um, but the, the the recipe that I have is um, from a website. If you want the recipe, send me an email. Sean at your show dot com. Um. It had just the right amount of, and I've learned these recipes I get just to add a titch more than what they say. So, if the, so for example, the recipe says uh, uh, a tablespoon of ginger. I put a tablespoon and a quarter. Or it says a tablespoon of clove. I put a tablespoon and a quarter Good of clove. Just, you, a li- just a little bit. I'm impressed. Um, for spices, for those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And took these things, and they're, they're easy to make. You just mush a bunch of stuff together. All the recipes I make are all basically that. Mush a bunch of stuff together. You, 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 they're not. Mush a bunch of stuff together. Yeah, they're, they're not complicated. It's just here's a list of things. Put them all in a bowl. Mm-hmm. Mix them all up. <clears throat> um, that's what this one was. This was butter and sugar and, and molasses and uh, salt, clove, ginger, cinnamon. Uh, nothing real super exotic or no, anything. Cookies, like cookies are. Throw the, it all in and mix I it up. I think one of the keys was. That and the recipe says this is once you make the little balls of chewy goodness, mm. don't put them in the oven right away. Put them in the fridge for mm. twenty minutes to let them firm up, let the butter harden up. Mm-hmm. Because if you put them in the fr- oven right away, they'll flatten out yes, a lot that's more. That's right. Yes. If you put them in the fridge, they'll firm up and then they can't flatten out as much. That's I right. think that's why they're so chewy and yummy in the middle. And you cooked them per- if you cooked them just a bit too much, they would have been too crunchy. Yes, that's right. Yes. And one of the problems we have is our oven is just really flaky. We got to get one of those oven thermometers to calibrate our oven. But I think I'm I'm getting our oven getting down. It down. And so I made these cookies, and uh, brought brought them in for, for Melissa, and just just was delicious. Oh, they are amazing. We had a bunch of twelve year old boys in here um, this afternoon, and I said they want want a cookie, and this. Kid Jackson by his cookie goes, that's a really good cookie. <laughs> and uh, the other cute little one, Josh, went, did you make these, Mr. King? <laughs> yes, Josh. He's Josh. He's so cute. He's Sean wants cute. to adopt Josh. I really want to adopt Josh. Adopt. He's awful to my children, but he wants to adopt someone else's child. I wouldn't say child. awful. I think I'm more oh. of the, the, no, I think I'm more of the disciplinarian than you are. I think that's my role. You would not discipline Josh if he lived here. No, because Josh is a good kid. Moving on, Sean. <laughs> I used to have all of my grandmother's beautiful handwritten and her beautiful cursive oh, really? writing that yeah. she did. Oh, my gosh, because Monty's talking about how he, you know, they're all lost, you know, his grandmother's. I d- my grandmother may have had recipes, but, and same with my mother, but I don't remember ever seeing them. Mm, oh I don't yeah. remember ever she seeing them. books and books. Really? It's beautiful. No. Um, yeah. My mom may have had them but I don't remember ever seeing my mother referring to any kind of paper or recipe book or anything else like that. 
Oh, well, after a while she didn't, but she had them all there. Really? Yeah, mm. and they were clippings and things that she'd discovered somewhere and women's weekly mm. recipes was all in these books. I think They're it's, lost. I think it's one of the things, I w- I've often wondered how um, book sales for cookbooks are doing now in the age of the internet. Yeah, well, not, yeah not very good. Or those uh, magazines that you see in the store mm. for cooking. For cooking. How are they doing? I can't believe that they'd be doing very good. No. Because why would I want a cookbook when I can get it on the internet? Yeah. Why would I want a cookbook if, in theory, I can get it on the Kindle or my That's iPad? Right. That's right. Why would I want a physical cookbook? I've kept my joy of cooking. The joy of cooking. Like I've never read that, but that's yeah, a classic. Why is that such oh. a good book for cooking? Because it's just the Bible of cooking. It's got everything and anything you need to know is in that big book. But you never use it. Because I never cook anymore. Oh, yeah. Somebody else cooks now. Has Lucky taken over you. my kitchen. Uh, Mac is Macman asking about. Um, so did Doofus on break oh. of the camera? Uh, <laughs> Macman, for some bizarre reason, QuickTime ten uh, that we've used every single Wednesday in the past to broadcast the video from the <laughs> iPad to you guys. QuickTime ten tonight just decides he doesn't want to do it. Ridiculous. I played with it for a good half hour. Monty tried to help me out. It didn't work. So he was swearing. Uh, well, I, it was Wednesday, <laughs> so of course I was fucking swearing. See, even Monty says that everyone should have a copy of The Joy of Cooking. Well, I'm so glad I, I do now. Uh, later in the show, we're going to talk about again in the starting point photography segment composition, composition, composition. Why it's important, what it is, and how you can use it in your shots. But up next, we're going to talk to our good friend Jim Downpaw of the Loop at LoopInsight.com. This is your Mac Life. Welcome back, folks. Thank you guys very much for joining me here on this Wednesday evening. Or if you're tuned into the archive, thank you very much for listening in that way. In our phone, as always, we've got a good friend, Jim Downpo of the Loop at loopinsight.com. Jim, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Sean. How are you? I'm I good. Almost, I, I almost didn't answer the phone. Well, why not? Well, because there was a hockey fight on the, <laughs> in the playoffs on TV. And just as the fight was going, you called. And I looked and thought, oh! <laughs> Don't you have a PVR? You can pause that stuff. Yeah, but it's a live fight. You got to see the fight. 
Yeah, I don't sure. Care about the goals. I want to see the fights. But you can. But you did not have any fights in playoff hockey now. Come on, just pause it well, and exactly. wait. Exactly. There's a lot of goals. I'll skip through those just to see the fights. <laughs> In two weeks' time, we'll be talking about WWDC. The Loop Bash is happening uh, once again at in, uh, in San Jose. One yeah. of the things that was interesting, I was talking to uh, my wife this afternoon about this, and she said, well, what's WWDC? And I thought, well, that's a good question. What is WWDC to you, Jim? What does it represent to you? Beer. <laughs> no, I, but life yeah, does that yeah, for you. So uh, WDC is where Apple basically gives developers um, guidance for where they're going in the next year. Yes. So this conference happens around the same time every year. And this is, I mean, Apple will give developers the State of the Union. The um, keynote introduces the high-level consumer-type uh, technologies that will become available. Yeah. And then developers go to courses, classes, to and labs to learn how to implement those new APIs and technologies into their own software. So this is really all the great apps that we get from developers throughout the year are because of WDC, when Apple introduces new ways to do things. And developers, to their credit, developers go out and figure out innovative ways to be able to pull all of these things together yeah. to make, you know, the next greatest app, whatever that may be, you know, that that could be a VR or an AR app. It could be, uh, it, you know, a social networking app. It could be almost anything. So this is, WDC is, is probably the most all around important event of the year. It, would you argue that's more important than the old Macworld Expos were? Yes. Even though at the time the two were going on, Macworld Expo was much, much bigger. Well, I don't see it's it's a different thing. Macworld Expo was a consumer facing uh, uh, trade show, yeah. whereas WDC is a developer focused event. And you need those developer-focused events in order to get developers to make the apps that they need to make. And, you know, sometimes Apple doesn't release great APIs. And from what I understand, you know, the Apple Music APIs were not great. So that makes it difficult for developers to, uh, to make apps that, you know, work well with Apple Music. But some of their other APIs work really well. And, you know, developers are able to uh, to make some great products from that. So that, to me, is so important and so important for the health of Apple and developers. So, you know, that's, well, that's putting what it, it all comes down to. Putting it that way, it makes me come up with another question that you say, because it's so important for developers and for Apple, the way that Apple is doing the tickets for this sort of make it a crapshoot whether or not those developers who are doing the next, who want to do the next great thing can actually get to a WWDC. Well, There's got to be a certain percentage of guys who go to WWDC who are utterly useless and shouldn't even be there. And they're stopping some guy in Munich who really, really has this great idea and needs to be WWDC from going. Doesn't that say, doesn't your argument mean that Apple's ticketing system for WWDC is kind of messed up? Well, well, it, I don't know if it's messed up. I think that they're doing the best they can with, with what they have. I mean, the fact is, WDC is so damn popular that they just can't fit everybody that wants to come in. Yeah. So, and, and they're not hiding all of this information from people that can't get a ticket. Yeah. They put it all online the next day so that developers, you know, Develop a developer right down the street in San Jose maybe didn't get a ticket, you know, but he can go online in the developer portal and watch the sessions that he wants to see. So, you know, all the information is there. It's just that you get to to go to the conference. And, of course, one of the big uh, pluses in going to the conference is the labs. Yes. The labs are hugely important. 
because for a developer, you're having problems with your app or an API or something. You get to go sit down with uh, an Apple engineer and say, here's the problem that I'm having. And why am I having this problem? And, you know, Apple will work with them to say, okay, no. here's what's going on and here's what you need to do. Or, um, you know, there's nothing we can do to help you no. or, you know, what, whatever the case is. That's, that's just how it goes. It's really a way for Apple to signal to, I think, arguably one of their top three communities that of developers, guys who make the software that go <clears throat> into the OS to signal to those guys, hey, here's where we're headed <clears throat> over the next 12 months. Hopefully you guys can come along with us, but this is where we're going. Hopefully right. you guys can, can join us on whatever journey it might be. <clears throat> yeah. Apple has kind of signaled, though, that they're going to, if not slow down the development of iOS and the macOS Maybe not make as big a splash with those every single year like they have done in the past. Do you agree with that? And do you think that's something Apple should be doing? Look, I, I, Apple did this years ago with macOS when it stopped doing, you know, the, the 200 new features no. in Leopard, Snow Leopard, and, and things like that, uh, operating systems like that. And you always knew that the second one was a release to kind of clean everything up. Yep. Because if you just start adding features, something is bound to break, especially with something that big. You know, so I think it's a great thing that they kind of pull back the reins a bit, put in a few new features. Sure, that's a great thing. Uh, especially for me, I, I think the integration between all of the OSs is, is hugely important. Mm. So uh, when they kind of hold back and say, let's get some stuff fixed, that's great. I have no issue with that. I think what what's important for Apple, though, is that they make that very clear to the media. The developers know it and developers understand it, but the media, because the media generally are relatively stupid, that if Apple doesn't put out that two, that list of 200 best things, the media will portray this as Apple falling behind. I think well, Apple needs to let the media know that this is a a not a bug fix release, but this is one where we're, we're going to focus on what's good about the OS kind of stuff. Well, and, you know, the media, not everybody in the media, and I'll, I'll say I'll put you and I in that category as well, uh, not the same one that I originally started off with, but we don't even understand the depth to which things need to be fixed oh, in God. the OS. No, not at all. So, you know, there are a lot of things in there, whether it's security or bug fixes or whatever, that need to be addressed. And, you know, for a journalist that writes for, you know, a non-technical publication, uh, like one of the wire services or something to say that, you know, this isn't a big release because they didn't release any new features, no. clear, clearly doesn't understand what they're talking about. The sad part is, no matter how much Apple tells them, they still won't believe it. Yeah. And, you know, meanwhile, all of the, um, the Mac uh, traditional tech press I think all of those people get it. You know, there is just no way to release 200 new features and update the OS so that it works, you know, crazy good. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, there's no way to do both. Well, I was looking at my OS and realizing that for the first time in a very, very long time, well, maybe the first time ever, I am two releases behind on my Mac OS. This is the first time that's happened to me since I started using the Mac 25 years ago because this is a stable version of Sierra for me. I know that High Sierra is going to break a bunch of stuff that I don't want broken, so I'm not upgrading anymore. And, and there's got to be a certain percentage of Apple's users, not everybody, not even a majority, who are feeling that way, that, that, that you know, let's get stuff fixed 
before we start adding new things to the to the pile? Well, I, I really think that a lot of this goes back to what we talked about before. I mean, there are certain segments of the market that will not update to the latest release. Yep. Music is, is obviously one. Yep. And my music machine uh, is, is still on Sierra. And that's not because I don't like High Sierra. I have High Sierra on my, uh, my other machines. But that machine is back a version because of all the music software that is back a version. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it has to be like that. So, you know, that's always going to happen. I'm still on Sierra and that. Uh, and I get, you know, as soon as I open up the App Store on that machine, it says, you know, upgrade to High Sierra. Well, perhaps after next week, I'll upgrade to High Sierra yeah. or the week after, you know. Uh, when the new version comes out, then, you know, High Sierra should be fine for all my music apps. But it takes about, it, it, well, it used to, and maybe this is just habit for me. It used to take about a year to get everything from the music companies yeah. uh, to be able to work properly. We know why you feel you need to be at a WWDC professionally. Why are you going there personally? What, what is it that you personally get out of a WWDC? Beer. Oh, I already said that. Um, I just, so, I, you know, I see a lot of friends there. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's great to see those people and, and to be able to, to talk to them and, you know, just get a feel for what's going on in the – in the world of, of the people that I know, yeah. you know, so, uh, WDC, especially in recent years where, uh, you know, it's been selling out of every year. Yep. Um, a lot of people will come without a ticket and, you know, they just go to the parties, they have dinner with people. I gotta get a beer. Oh, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, they have um, uh, friends that they see all the time. And, you know, I I know people that are coming this year, again, that don't have a ticket. Yep. But they're, they're going to come to my party. They're going to, uh, you know, they've got dinners with friends. They're going to hang out. And, you know, and I, it's all good. It's a, it's a big social event. And there are other things going on around WWDC. There's a layers conference is going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's a, a couple other uh, developer type events that are going on. So even if you can't get into WWDC, there's the accidental meeting up with people in hallways and in bars and that kind of stuff. It's, it's something I've always said about conferences in general and certainly WWDC specifically. It's hard to see eye to eye if you don't meet face to face. Right. It, it's as much as people say that conferences are no longer needed because of the internet, because of FaceTime and, and video and all that kind of stuff. I still believe people in a particular industry need to get together to look each other in the eye every now and then to, to meet over a beer yeah. or to wave, wave across a lineup and go, Hey, there's that guy kind of thing. I still think that's important. It's one of the reasons why I, I l will always lament the demise of Mac World Expo because that was, the consumer version of what folks go to WWDC for, uh, even, I, if, I, even if even if you got nothing, agree. even if you got nothing from the show floor, and in the later years the show floor could be kind of lame if you're one of the old jaded folks. It was the interaction with other people, whether they be at Apple or whether they be at Smile Software, whether they be at Griffin Technology, or whether they be at a bar somewhere. That um, if nothing else, energized you for the rest of the year. You know, you'd see that person's name on Twitter, and you go, oh, yeah, I know who that guy is. I had a beer with him at, at, at a party, or I saw him speak at this conference. And that makes a huge difference. I don't think we're we'll ever going to be able to rely solely on the Internet for these kinds of things. I think conferences like WWDC and, again, the late lamented well, Expo were very important. I, I, I personally, I absolutely agree with you. Now, I don't know that everybody would because the way that we communicate has really changed, yeah. you know? So, um, you know, would the, the new generation hear what you're saying and say, Oh yeah, I totally agree with you. They'd probably say, no, I don't need to see anybody. Yeah. I don't want to see anybody. 
you know, and I personally, I, I don't like that, but that's where we are. Interesting. I, I, I hadn't thought about that from a, a generation point of view, but maybe you're right. Maybe yeah. there's a generation that is upcoming that no longer needs to see people face to face. I actually hadn't thought of it that way. I, I don't think that they do, yeah. but you know, when you look at you and I and people like us, yeah, we, we all want to get together and, and be able to talk and have a beer and have dinner and everything else. But I don't know that everybody does. Interesting. Uh, the Loop Bash, the party formerly known as the Beard Bash, is also going on on the first Monday of WWDC. Uh, tell us about that. So... The Loop Bash this year is being held at the Ritz in San Jose. It's uh, um, It's the first time you're having it at the Ritz, isn't isn't it? Yeah, it's first time at the Ritz. I predict it'll be uh, the last time, too. Why? Because they've never met you. Yeah, well, that's true. You're going to go there. They're going to meet you. They're going to go, we're the Ritz. What the hell? What the hell? Who no, let no, this no. guy into the Ritz? No, 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 no. It's not like that at all. Are you sure? Yeah, it's not... Like the Ritz Hotel. This oh. is a nightclub. Oh, okay. See, I thought it was Ritz Hotel. No. Well, that's different then. Okay. This is the nightclub. Okay, good. And <laughs> and uh, it is a, a just amazing looking place. Yeah. I mean, it's it's going to be such a fun party. Your band is the Silicon Valley House Rockers? Yes. Um, and led by... A friend of both of ours, uh, Paul Kent. Who is an amazingly uh, good guitar player. Amazing guitar Re- player. Surprisingly, I yeah. Paul. Uh, uh, just, it's so good to uh, to watch Paul play guitar. For those of you who were lucky enough to uh, come to the uh, Macworld Expo parties that Sly put on, um, they were your Mac Live parties, but Sly put them on. Uh, she, yeah. she hired uh, the, Hill Con- the Silicon Valley House Rockers. And uh, I think if only because uh, Paul Kent would do Bruce Springsteen songs for her. Yeah, and exactly. Right. They were so good. They had, I think they had a, a five, six piece horn section and the yeah, horn yeah. section was just incredible. Oh, now, now that being that said, player? Our, Oh, the sax it's player is incredible. Incredible. Yeah. One of the best pictures I've ever taken is of that sax player. I'll have to dig that up and show folks. Um, will you be on stage? I will. Cool. Good. Good. To, I, good. Good. I'm going to do a couple songs with the band. See, now that's the thing. They don't know what they're getting into. <laughs> I'm not worried about the Ritz. I'm worried about the band. They may just walk off stage after I get up there. Well, for, for you folks who remember the uh, the, uh, the Macworld All-Star Band, this ain't it. The All-Star Band was awful, and they knew they were awful. The Silicon Valley House Rockers are not awful. Uh, Jim is sending no, out... I- Go ahead. I liked the, I liked the uh, the All Star Band. I thought it was pretty good. Well, as Chris Breen said, with a lack in talent, they made up for an enthusiasm. Right. Perfect. They, they, they were just a fun band, but yeah. I preferred uh, the the House Rockers. Uh, you're sending out RSVPs now, correct? I am. Do, do people can people still apply for tickets, or are all tickets spoken for? No, they can get, they can go get tickets. Yeah. Go to the loop uh, loop at loopinsight.com and do a search for Loop Bash to find out where you can pick up extra tickets. We missed the show last week, and and don't think we talked about it before. There's been a very interesting, um, maybe too inside baseball, but a very interesting story going on with regards to the Google Assistant demo that Google did their I/O conference mm. a couple of weeks ago. First of all, what did you think of the demonstration itself? Did it well, freak you out? I I thought it was great. It I freaked really me did. out. I kind of I thought it was great. I mean, you know, it was just the fact that a machine could voice not not concern, but voice human characteristics no. during a conversation. I thought was absolutely amazing. I mean, yeah. If you look at this technology, it it is amazing that it can say, mm-hmm. you know, oh, just give me a sec, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, just flat out amazing. That See, I didn't find I didn't find that amazing. It was just all all the the thing was pre programmed to wait for a five millisecond pause and say, mm-hmm. That's not that's not amazing. Well, 
if that's what it can do, then it's amazing. But, you know, we talked about before, if this was a tech demo, then that's a different thing than a demo. Yes. Now, uh, um, John Gruber and uh, the the uh, fans of Daring Fireball did a lot more investigation on this, and shame on Mashable, by the way, for stealing Gruber's story. Um, Gruber found out, or has found out, a lot of other information along with the, the his uh, Daring Fireball uh, Twitter fans. And in a nutshell, it seems like everything may not be above board with regards to this. But that being said... Is that really a problem? This was a tech demo. Uh, we're well, used to these things being uh, either heavily scripted or at least heavily staged. What what should have happened is either they say it is a tech demo or here is an actual call. Yeah. And let's do the call. And let's do the call. Yeah. I think that was part of the problem is that Google hasn't come hasn't been up front with subsequent questions from the media of saying was that an actual call? And the problem is because Google knows that if it was an actual call and they recorded it and didn't tell the other person, that's a criminal act in the state of California. Yeah, and that's I mean, they're screwed no matter which way they go. No, <laughs> exactly. it was no it was faked or yes we didn't broke the law. That's I mean, right. you know, really. <laughs> Which one of those do you want? <laughs> That's right. They're screwed coming and going on this one. Also, yeah. they have said subsequent to the demonstration, oh, no, don't worry. We will make sure this thing identifies itself as a robot in the future. It really struck me as sad and funny and so typical of Google that they didn't see these issues coming before they actually happened. I mean, if Google had asked anybody how to do this tech demo – we would have all told them, be upfront about this stuff. Don't put it off till afterwards. Google's always going to have ethical considerations, ethical questions asked of them just by the nature of who they are and the screw-ups they've done in the past. So what they should have done was head these off of the past before the media ever got hold of the story. Just to be clear, if you ever have your robot call me, I'll hang up. Yes, absolutely. Please do. And then you can fly to Vancouver and punch me in the throat. Yeah. If I'm using a Google Assistant, if I'm using a robot, no. And this is something you and I talked about a couple of weeks ago when we talked about this. You don't mind this technology, do you? No, I don't. See, I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I think it's it's dehumanizing for both you as the user, but also for the person on the other end. There's a certain social contract that this thing breaks by... Well... <clears throat> I think that could be generational again. True. Fair point. I really do. I understand that a lot of people find these kinds of conversations boring or painful or they just don't like doing them. But guess what? It's part of living your life. And it doesn't take that much time to call the hairdresser and say, I need an appointment for next Wednesday. You know what I mean? Well, we're, we're, I, we're, we're removing. I, I get it. We're removing human interactions from so many different things that this is just another example of it, and it's unnecessary. I don't know that it's going to go back, though. It's only no. going to go forward. Yeah. And, you know, things that you said about autonomous driving yep. have, have kind of – I feel the same way about that. As I see more Waymo vehicles, you know, cruising the streets of Palo Alto and, and – uh, uh, Cupertino and Redwood City and Mountain View, you know, the, they're all over the place. Yeah. And, you know, it just kind of hit home recently that, you know what? That thing is probably safer than the guy behind him driving who's now reading his text messages. Yeah, probably. And it's a sad statement. It really is that, you know, I'm... I drive around here. I see people texting on their phone. Yep. I want to get a sign from my car that I can hold up out the window and say, get off your fucking phone, yep. you moron. That's right. I, I, I want them to pass a law where motorcycles are allowed to kick you in the door when we yeah. go by you and see you texting in your goddamn phone. Yep. And it happens it, all the time. It happens just every single time I ride my motorcycle, no matter where I go, when I pass somebody. And you can spot them, too. 
Oh yeah, you can. I mean, they're the ones that are weaving back and forth be- between the white lines and and jerking the wheel around, and and you pull up next to them. Sure enough, they're looking down in their crotch. That's where the phone is. Yep. It's awful. It but, really is. But the 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 Google Assistant stuff. It's going to be very interesting to see what Apple says about this at WWDC in two weeks. Now, Apple's not going to react to it in the sense that Apple's already done what they're going to do. WWDC was put to bed a month ago, if not longer. Apple's not going to have a direct reaction to Google. That being said, and ignoring the idiotic stories last week of Siri telling people that she's going to get smarter at this particular WWDC, that was an old story from 2017, as Dave Mark pointed out on MoopInsight.com. Apple does have to do something, don't they? They have to show some sort of progress with Siri, don't they? Well, I, I think we've been waiting for Siri progress for for quite a while. Yeah. Um, maybe Siri is better than what it used to be. I I don't really know because I I still run into some of the same problems that I had a while ago yeah. and. You know, um, I I just I want Siri to be the best, and it's I just don't think that it is. One of the problems Apple's going to have, though, is, and I see this with with my wife, that after a few attempts, she has stopped, and she's not going to go back. Right. She has no interest in using Siri anymore to set up calendars or to set up appointments or even timers. She just doesn't want you know, Siri annoys the hell of her. She has an Australian accent, which might be part of the problem. But for her, she she and that's this is the vast majority of people are non techy. If they try something two, three, four times, it doesn't work. They're never going to try it again. You can't go back to those people six months from now and say, "Oh, Siri got better." They're like, "Yeah, don't care." Yeah, they're not going to care. Well, so Apple may have a, it, a very hard hill to climb. In the interim what happens is that people find other ways to do things without Siri. Yeah. And, you know, I said it before, Siri works great in CarPlay. You know, if I want to send a text or I uh, get a text and I listen to it when I'm driving, uh, that's all good. Everything works great. I pull up my iPhone and try the same thing, and it just, it's downhill. Yep. Yeah. Siri works great on my HomePod. Pull up my watch, and often it says, sorry, I didn't get that. Can you try again? Yeah. No, yeah, I can't. Right. Exactly. No, I just get me bothered. I had, yeah, a, I had a moment there, and you ruined it, Siri. Now I'm, now I'm pissed off. That's right, exactly. You know, I, want, I want nothing to do with you. Yep, that's right. It's, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what Apple does at WWDC to let their developer community know that they're moving forward with what seems to be a pretty important technology. Now, the problem with that is that Apple hasn't let developers get their hooks into Siri the way Amazon has allowed developers to get their hooks into Alexa. And I don't think Apple's ever going to. I think Apple's always going to be behind the eight ball in this one because they, they're, they're wonderful, in my opinion, uh, requirement for privacy and sandboxing of their apps won't allow them to let developers play around with Siri the way developers can on the Amazon Echo side of things. Well, and it's interesting because Amazon is not only letting developers in on it, they're letting fridge manufacturers and, you know, everybody can get in on uh, Alexa. And, you know, it, it will become the default. And, you know, Microsoft has one. What's theirs? Cortana. Yeah. Um, I haven't really tried that, so I I can't really speak to that. But um, I saw a story in the last week where Samsung is is going to release it Bixby uh, that it's ready or will be ready. Yep. So, you know, there's there's all kinds of them out there. A uh, Google Assistant is obviously it's probably the most prevalent uh, in in the Android market, but I I dare say that Amazon is is going to be more prevalent in the overall market. Yes, I agree. I agree. Just because they've opened it up so much to so yep. many different aspects of it, and 
um, Ben Bajaran over at techpinions.com and creativestrategies.com makes a really interesting point that once people get comfortable with a particular virtual assistant, they stick with that virtual assistant. So by yeah. Amazon getting Echo out into a wide market, Alexa is known by a lot of different people. The next time that person goes to buy some sort of similar device, say now I've got an Amazon Echo. What, what Ben has said that people then go to home hardware and they see a thermostat that says Alexa enabled. Well, they'll buy that thermostat or these yeah, lights. I agree. These lights are Alexa enabled. Well, I'll buy those lights. And it locks them into the Alexa ecosystem, which luckily is also a very wide, broad, and growing ecosystem. So Apple is way, way behind on this. Well, yeah, yes and no, because I don't know that Apple ever wants to get into that. Mm, true. Possibly, so, yeah. uh, you know, Alexa is is ahead of whoever wants to get into that market. Yeah. And, and we don't know who that is. I mean, will Samsung put their voice assistant on there, perhaps, uh, on their fridges and everything else? Um, you know, it's it's tough to say where all this goes yeah. because it depends on what your uh, what your outlook is. I mean, I don't think Apple wants to get into that, so Siri will never be on a fridge. But I'd want it to be. If I wanted to have that ho that connected home, that home automation thing, I want to be able to say. Hey Alexa, turn on the bathroom lights. Hey Alexa, run the faucet in the tub for me. Hey Alexa, turn on the air conditioning. If I'm going to get into it, I want to get all the way into it, and I well, want to buy know. completely into someone's ecosystem. I, I don't know that there is a way to get all the way into. Uh, well, you can certainly you can certainly get closer with Amazon, and you get the sense that Amazon is going to bring you to that future sooner faster maybe even better than apple and siri or google i don't disagree with that mm -hmm. uh it, again depending on what your definition of that is yeah yeah i don't, I don't disagree with that i think I, I one of these i hope is that apple gives us some sense of their direction with this so we can if nothing else stop having this conversation so we can stop yeah. wondering if apple's going to be going in that home automation direction or whether they're going to go to straight music type stuff and that'd be fine just let us know Folks, been talking to Jim Downpo of The Loop at loopinsight.com. He's here each and every week. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Sean. Talk later. Enjoy the game. Bye. Thanks. Yes. With Jim Downpo of The Loop at loopinsight.com. When we come back in our starting point photography segment, we're going to talk about composition, 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 why it's so important, and why you should be focused on it like a laser beam. This is your Mac Life. Hello, my name is Melissa King. I'm your Mac Life's official Spokes Australian. As Sean begins his 25th year of broadcasting on the internet, he has asked me to say a few words to you all. Send money. What? Why not? More? Okay. When you listen to your Mac Life, you'll notice there are no ads, no commercial breaks. No five-minute ad reads for products you've already bought or have no interest in buying. That's because Your Mac Life is entirely listener-supported. And not even listener-supported via a paywall or a subscription service. It's simple. If you like Your Mac Life, you can pay for it. If you don't want to pay for it, you don't have to. You can still listen. But we'd really like it if you did. On the Your Mac Life homepage at yourmaclifeshow.com, on the top left, there is a subscribe to YML box. You can send any amount you'd like each month automatically from your credit card or PayPal account. It's set for $2, $5, $10 or $15, but you can set it for any amount by clicking the Donate button. The best part is you'll barely notice it. It's $2, but it makes a huge difference to us here at Your Mac Life. It means we can pay for website hosting, internet access, new computers and software to run the show on, and so much more. So, if you like your Mac Life, please subscribe. $2 will make a tiny dent in your wallet, but when enough people subscribe, it makes a huge difference to your Mac Life. I'm Melissa King. Thank you.
Welcome back to Your Mac Life. I'm Sean King, joined, as always, by my beautiful wife, Melissa. How are you, Melissa? I'm good. Melissa isn't on video tonight because, for some reason, QuickTime 10 decided it wanted to go it's for rejected me. Shit, and the crow's got it. <laughs> okay, let's try this again, okay? Melissa. Yes, Sean? What's the single most important thing in photography? <gasps> Composition. How did you know that? Monty. <laughs> Monty. No. <laughs> I know you. It's true. Uh, the, the way your photograph looks, the way your image looks, either to yourself or to the viewer, your friend that you're looking at, a complete stranger, whatever it is, the way it's composed is the single most important thing. It doesn't matter if your lighting is perfect and your composition is off. It doesn't matter if your focus is perfect and your composition is off. It None of anything matters if your composition isn't pleasing to the eye not that it's a pleasing photo but that it's pleasing to the eye and a lot of composition weirdly and interestingly enough and this is something that really took me a long time to wrap my mind around <clears throat> a lot of the ideas of composition are subconscious we as human beings think we want to see images dead center of a of a square or, or or of a rectangle so when we take pictures as beginners we just naturally put that person's face or that flower or that child's nose or uh, the the animal in the dead center of our image well it turns out that's not what you do it's this thing called the rule of thirds and what you do is in composition you see the image that you want to take a picture of and then you pretend visualize a tic-tac-toe board going across your image and on a lot of cameras your iphone uh, your dslrs a lot of cameras will do this it's called a grid you can turn the grid on and you can actually see overlaid your image that tic-tac-toe board and the funny thing is and i guarantee you if you start doing this in your photos they'll get better turn that grid on in the iPhone, it's um, go to settings and then camera and then scroll to the very, very bottom and you'll see grid at the bottom. Just turn the grid on. If you start doing this one little trick, your photos will get better. And the trick is weirdly simple. Whatever you think is important in your photo, whatever you are shooting that you think is the thing that you want to focus on, don't put it in the center square i know right you think that's where you should put it center square i'm gonna date myself like paul lind in hollywood squares <laughs> she's you're that old too wow <laughs> they have hollywood squares in australia yes you did and so, so you know who paul lind is yes oh damn so you don't want that's the think of that as the paul lind square for you old old fogies don't put anything in there except paul lind and he's dead, so you can't put anything in there. So you want to move what you think is important in your image out of the center. So that's the first most basic rule of composition. Whatever you think is important, don't put it in the center. So if it's someone's face, just have their face off center just a little bit. If it's a face in particular, what I want you to do is, using that tic-tac-toe board, put one of their eyes on the intersection of the tic-tac-toe board, on the cross, hmm. usually the upper one. And, and this is the extra tip, tap on their eye, on your iPhone. Because what happens when you tap, it tells the iPhone, focus on this spot. So find their closest eye. So if they're if they're in a three-quarter profile to you, tap the eye that's closest to you, and your iPhone will focus on that person's eye. And when you tap them, the iPhone focuses. You know you've got them their eye in the tic-tac-toe board. And I guarantee you, guarantee you, that your photos of people will start to get better. Hmm. It just can't help it. It's the single tip I teach. It's my very first tip. I teach in all, all my photography classes. And if you don't do anything else in photography, if you do that thing, then it will make your photography better. MacMan points out, if the eyes are out of focus, people will notice very quickly. 
consciously or subconsciously. The rest of your shot can be in perfect focus, but if the eyes of the thing are out of focus, it's a bad shot. The rest of the composition could be perfect. But if the eyes are out of focus, we as human beings are used to seeing perfectly in focus eyes on people, animals, statues, whatever it might be. That's why I say tap on the eye because that will make the eye in focus. Not the nose, not the forehead. Tap on their eye. Is Melissa doing that now? I'm going to, yes. <laughs> I'll wait. You're going to wait. Oh, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. This is why you got to be ready nerd, to I'm shoot. I'm not a nerd. I'm not a nerd. What are, you, oh. what are you flicking? What are you doing? Never mind. Okay, now put your eye on the intersection of the tic tac toe. Got it. And then, and then tap, tap on, on it. it. Yes. See that little, how that little square will pop up? Oh, yes. That's, so that square says that's what's in focus. Got it. Yeah, Monty, ah. out of focus eyes weird lots of people out. Yeah, it does weird. And sometimes you don't even know why you're weirded out. You just you just are. a lot. Like I said, a lot of your appreciation of photography is subconscious. That you won't like something and you don't know why you won't like it. And something I teach students, too, is when you look at a photo and don't like it, think about why you don't like it. What is it about the photo that you don't like? Is it the focus? It's in or out of focus. Is it the colors? Is it the subject matter? Is it the composition? That's how you can get better, too, is by looking at images and seeing what you don't like about those images. So that's the first thing I teach people. One of the things that I personally have constantly got to learn, especially when I'm using my DSLR, <clears throat> is my, as I've said this many times, my eyes are on crooked. Every photo I take mm -hmm. is four degrees off center. It's <laughs> so weird. It is so weird. So what you want, and because the horizon in a lot of shots is, a, is often a straight line, if that line is crooked, it throws your viewer off. Again, even if it's subconscious, your viewer might look at the photo and go, oh, we don't like that. And it might just be because your horizon line is slightly tilted. And that happens a lot with the iPhone because a lot of the times when we're using the iPhone, we're holding it out here like this, which is not, sometimes it's not, you're not perfectly holding it perfectly level. Now, there are some apps that will show you a level on your screen. But if you have the grid on, you can use that grid as sort of a way of seeing whether your horizon is, is correct. So you look at the picture, you have the image composed, then just look to the background and see if the, your background lines up with the grid lines on your photo. Mm. And speaking of horizon, you can use that at the same time to make sure your horizon isn't dead center of your shot. So if you have the grid turned on and you're shooting in the landscape mode, the long way, you look, if the horizon line is right in the center of your shot, if it's right in the center of your grid, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. It's one of those things that subconsciously your shot automatically isn't light because of that. It's very rare that even the pros can have a horizon right across the center and have the photo look good. And the, again, it's a simple fix. Just like composition, just like the rule of thirds, it's a simple fix of moving so the person's head is in the center, your c composition fix for your horizon is simple. Just mm -hmm. tilt your camera up. Just lift your camera up to get more sky. Sorry, tilt your camera up to get more sky or tilt it down to get more ground. You shouldn't have the same amount of sky and the same amount of ground in your shot. Mm -hmm. Have more of one or the other. And so if your sky isn't very interesting, get rid of it. Shoot more ground. If your ground is dark and not being able to see, like for example, you're shooting a sunset, Get more sky. Monty says, too much symmetry in landscape horizon shots is boring. Yeah, absolutely. And it's another one of those great examples of something that, as the viewer, you may not even know why you don't like the shot, why you think the shot is boring. We, there was an Instagram shot that you, that you showed me last night as we were flipping through our Instagram feeds, looking at images, and you showed me this beautiful sunset. The color was great. It was a wonderfully composed shot, except... Horizon dead center. Yes, it was. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it made the photo less interesting. For me. Yes. So keep yep. that keep that in mind. Um, 
one of the other things I always remind folks to do, and it, this takes a lot of practice. So don't beat yourself up if you don't do this. Um, Melissa has done it in the past, and I know you've, you've really ragged yourself about it. You've got the shot. Let's say it's someone's face. You've got this beautiful face. You have your cute little son, little redheaded boy, is sitting there, and you take a picture, and then after you get it home, you look at it, and you know, there's a branch in front of his head. <laughs> well, yeah. Or going through the back of his head kind of thing. Yeah. What happens with that is that we get so focused on the subject of our shot, and we're looking for that image that we maybe see in our mind's eye, and we're like, okay, there it is, there's a shot, and take the picture. Without looking to the four corners of your image without looking to see if there's a branch sticking up out of someone's head or a telephone wire going through or a, 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 something in the way in the background that doesn't make your shot look good. It's the thing I do just before I push the shutter button, whether I'm using my DSLR or whether I'm using my iPhone, just quickly look in the corners. Just see if there's some sort of distracting element there or something I don't want in there. At the same time, when you're looking to the edges, the next thing I think about is, can I get closer to remove anything that's not important in the shot? As a beginner, I teach beginners to focus on one thing, get really good at shooting one thing at a time, whether that's a flower or a face or a dog or a door, and get as close to that one thing as you can. Fill the frame with that one thing. Tell the story of you, uh, Rory, climbing the tree and what, what you did. Oh, well, because I am less and less getting the extraneous things sticking out of people's heads, and I, I'm more aware of it than yeah. ever. So I I took my shoes off and climbed under all the branches and uh, got into a really good position so I could take his picture. And then I took one and I went, nope, nope, you got to move because there was a branch, and he looked great in that shot, yeah. but there was a branch Going. So I got I worked hard to get into a really good position to that's, take the photograph of him. That's a key. That's a really good thing. That that sentence. I've worked hard. You'll rarely have shots consistently that you just go pretty click done. Rarely. You will get them every now and then. You'll get lucky and you'll get that that shot. Most of the good shots that you take, the good shots that you see, have a lot of work behind them. Whether that's work mentally, thinking about the shot, work physically, waiting for the right light, or waiting for that person to walk through the frame, or waiting for that thing, or traveling to a place to get the, the shot you want. There's good shots almost always take work. Your photography is not going to get better if you're not willing to work at it. As I said, say in my class, learn, focus, practice. you got to do those things. Here's a. So, one, one. I'm just uh, looking at Mac Man saying getting his damn finger out of the shots. Sometimes <laughs> it's true. Sometimes you go through periods where you, your finger is in the shot. Well, that's one of the reasons why I, I. How you hold your iPhone is entirely up to you. A lot of folks do do it like this, and that's why they get their finger in the shot mm -hmm. because that's that's where where they're holding it, and they don't notice because they're looking at the subject. They don't notice their finger is covering part of the lens. Mm -hmm. So what I when I shoot, I find this way of shooting much more stable. Mm, I know. My yeah. hand's not going. My fingers aren't going to get in the way. I've got a stable platform for, and it's not comfortable for a lot of people. I'm, no, I don't like it. I can't I'm lucky do it. in that I've got a you know bigger hand, but for me with that finger out there, can, can so you can't hold well, your camera. You like and this? I have done this before, where I I, I no, find left that hand. I'm using my left hand. No. No. <laughs> no, sl slide the camera further this way. So this to finger. To my left? Yes. No, no, you got the wrong finger. This finger on top. This finger on top. That finger on the edge. There you go. No. No? Don't like okay. It. No. That's fine. Not for me. But so for me, I find this, and then I can hold it like this, so I can use two hands. And I find I get a very stable platform this way with no chance of my finger getting away but that's uh, melissa can't do it a lot of folks don't like this particular position i like it one of the problems that we have is the way the phone is set up is that way the camera is set up on, on 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 the phone is that um when you go to press the shutter button on the phone 
because you're hitting your camera, you're going to move it a little bit. You're going to cause movement, and movement generally is death on the camera. So I find holding it in this position allows me to very gently, just barest of mm. tap on that big white button on the phone. You stab at it, you're going to move the camera. Even if you don't think you are, we generally are, aren't stable enough platform when you stab at it. So you want to make sure it's a very, very smooth shot, a very, very smooth tap on the on the shutter button. Remember, there's also other ways of doing the shutter button too. Your your uh, volume button on the sides of your phone will also click the shutter button, and your headphone volume button if you want to use the headphones. The headphones don't have, don't have to be in. I've used my phone with my headphones not on my phone, so I can get shots like that and and use rather than having to stab at my phone. I will have my headphones plugged in and then use the headphone button to get more stable shots or put the phone down somewhere to get a different angle on the shot and then use the headphone button to get the shot that I way. use my timer a lot more than you. you you've, you've, you've often, I'm surprised by that. I don't know why, where you learned that, but it's, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with using your, using your timer. I found the timer on iOS 11 and the uh, iPhone 10 to be really wonky. It just does not work nearly as well as it should. And it, we, sometimes the, the 10 second timer um, takes three seconds. Oh, it's I've never really, had that really issue. Buggy. Well, I've used it a lot if I've wanted to take shots of myself doing yoga and I'll put the timer on, put the phone down and press and then run and get into my yoga, <laughs> yoga pose. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. So keep some of those tips in mind when you're, when you're shooting next. It, they're really simple. Composition. How it looks in the frame of your camera. Don't put things that are important in the center. Turn on your grid, your rule of third, and keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, look to look to your horizon. Look to the line in the back and make sure it's straight and not dead center. Learn, focus, practice. So you learn this stuff, you focus on it when you go shooting, and you practice shooting, and it becomes automatic. I guarantee you now, when I pick my camera up, to shoot. I've got my grid turned on. I'm supposedly a professional. My grid's turned on on my iPhone. It's turned on on the M1. It's turned on on my iPad. It's turned on on my DSLR. Every camera I have, my grid's turned got on. Your grid, yeah. So it's a really quick, easy reminder of where the rule of thirds is, what my composition is, where my horizon is, and that kind of stuff. So stick, stick with it and keep practicing. As always, if you have any questions about this stuff, send us emails to uh, onair at yourmaclifeshow.com or to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com, and I'll do my best to answer any of the questions that you guys might have about photography. Well, I know we got a couple of questions. we got um, Jason Painter down there in Sydney, Australia. says, I read this article from fstoppers.com. Act now. Your Flickr account is being transferred. He says, I'm wondering what you think. In my case, because there are no photos of my Flickr account I don't already have locally and backed up multiple times, I don't really see the point of downloading them. Interesting to see, have, hear what you say about it. The article is a little bit of um, Chicken Little. Uh, for those folks who may not realize it, Smug Mug, the photography website sa sales company, has bought Flickr. In general, it's a good thing because Yahoo didn't know what the hell to do with, with Flickr. But there was a concern that the folks at Smug Mug were going to do something, a ill-defined something, that was going to make Flickr worse. And that you should download your photos off of Flickr in order to save them from any changes that Smug Mug might make. That's not a bad thing. You should have copies of your photos anyway, locally. But from what I understand, uh, what I've, I've, I follow uh, Smug Mug on Twitter. Don McCaskill is the CEO of Smug Mug. They have said in all of their communications they are going to do nothing to Flickr or Smug Mug for at least the first six months. Flickr will be Flickr. Smug, Smug Mug will stay fl Smug Mug. In other words, Flickr will stay free for the most part. Smug Mug will stay pay. They don't anticipate making any changes to that. So right now, I really wouldn't worry too much about it, except for the fact that if you don't have a copy of your photos, you should definitely have a copy of them. Is that Jason? Jason that Painter. 
J- Japestagram, Insta- Japester yes, Instagram. Yes, Japester. Yes. Well, I just wanted to make sure we t- tell him that his pictures are getting better. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm absolutely. not sure. I don't remember if we did or not, but they are getting better. Uh, our friend Don, sorry, uh, Jason also followed up with, uh, he said, Dear Sean, I bought a Nikon 18-300 lens. We talked about this big, giant lens two weeks ago. With my first DSLR, it's a crop sensor lens, so it's not physically very big. Like you say, quality is average to poor. It has these issues. This lens has a maximum aperture of f3.5, which is not really great. Remember, f one third. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Which is not fast. The images are a bit fuzzy. Hmm. Because the lens hood has to accommodate the wide angle end, it's short. And you really could do the longer hood, the telephoto end of the range. I generally don't like zooms because the compromise is like these. So with my new Nikon FX DSLR, I'm using primes. That's one of the things I talked about when I talked about this lens. It sounds like a great deal. 18300 that sounds fantastic. But it's not a high-quality lens. Mm. Don't get suckered into, if you can find a good deal on this kind of lens, get it. But get it only from the point of view of, because you want to practice 300 millimeter shooting. It's not, you're not going to get great images at 300 millimeters on this lens, this 18 300 millimeter lens. It just isn't good quality. At that anywhere, it's average everywhere. It's poor at 300 millimeters. They're just not good quality glass on the inside of it. And that's reflected in the price. The price is about, uh, hang on, before I say anything, let me just check to make sure about the price. I'm going to guess right now the price of that lens on Amazon is under $500 uh, US. Let me just really quickly put this into my Amazon thing and see 500 that last that yeah. Monty checked less yeah. than 500 less than no, 594 dollars for a Nikon 1834 that's not a good lens it's just not don't don't spend 500 so Jason bucks Jason bought one Jason bought one yeah obviously before he listened to me um <laughs> Don Beck uh from uh, summersweet.org uh, Don says you mentioned a 70 millimeter DSLR DSLR lens is too telephoto to get good portrait shots I hope I didn't say that, Don. If I did, I apologize and I'll explain why. My mind is so calibrated to 35 millimeter SLRs I used to use. For them, a 90 millimeter was considered a good portrait lens. Can you explain full frame SLR lenses compared to DSLR lenses? Don, no, I can't. I've never used full frame SLRs. Um, I think they're awfully close. Anything 70 to 75 millimeters to about 120 is going to make a decent, if not great, portrait lens. Because it allows you to get physically far enough away or co- close enough to the, to the subject to get good shots, but not so close that your wide-angle lens makes their features all weird and freaky. You're also not getting up into the personal space of the, the model. They can feel freer not having someone directly in front of you and you can get some incredibly incredibly high quality lenses at that 70 millimeter to 120 millimeter range for portrait lenses generally what you want to do with a portrait lens also is get a prime lens they're going to be more expensive but they're also going to be very they're going to be a lot higher quality glass mm-hmm. um, i tell the story all the time that <clears throat> when melissa and i were out uh, shooting with the uh, the Olympus M1, <clears throat> and she was getting very, very frustrated because she couldn't get uh, decent shots with um, the settings that the camera's on. She was a brand new camera to her, brand new photographer. She was really getting frustrated. I popped on the, is this it? Yes, I popped on the 75 millimeter uh, 1.8 aperture lens. Uh, this is a portrait lens for the Olympus M1, and told her, you know, start taking pictures of me. And you took some great shots. You took some shots that you really, really liked. Mm. You looked at the back of the camera. And you felt all good and jazzed up. Like, I did. You felt really good about, <laughs> yes, yes, I can do this, I can do this. <laughs> it was a combination of using the right equipment, mm-hmm. using the right lens. And the great thing with the 75 millimeter lens is because it doesn't zoom, it forces you to stand in the right place. Like, you cannot get a yes. good portrait shot of someone. If, you, if I'm using the 75 millimeter lens, I can't stand this close and get a good shot. The 75 millimeter lens, because it has no zoom, forces you to go and stand in that spot to take good pictures. You can't get too close, because mm. otherwise your shot's just, you know, my ball. Mm. So that was a great thing about it, is that there's no guesswork 
of the lens to take good portraits. It, it, it showed you how to get good portrait shots just by, by the, the way that was set up. You had to stand in that spot and just push the shutter button. Uh, what else did I get email wise? This was the nicest. Oh, by the way, speaking of nicest, my wife. <laughs> see, see what I did there? <laughs> see what I did there? It was, her, it was her birthday last week. She she turned forty seven again. <laughs> I, tell, I never lie. Do not lie about my age. Looks fantastic, no matter what age. You <laughs> um, and mine was uh, two weeks before. That's right, sweetheart. It's kind of funny that our, our birthdays are ten days apart. Mm -hmm. So I think we should celebrate on the twelfth from now on. All right, be right in the middle. That sounds great. Yeah, five, Let's five do days it. On the other side of it. All right. So officially on the show, I want to wish you a happy birthday. Oh, and I happy hope you birthday. had a good birthday. I had a lovely birthday. She got chocolate truffle cakes. Oh cookies. my god. Oh. Chocolate truffle cookies. Oh. Oh my God, they were just they were obscene. oh, they're obscenely, they're just, disgustingly, they're good. disgustingly good. <laughs> but speaking of that, uh, Don Donald Hen Hennessy, New York, uh, Long Island Macintosh user group member, said, uh, "Dear Melissa and Sean, as our favorite couple in Canada, please have a happy Victoria Day this past Monday." Yes, he said, "Your Gibson District Library homepage showed me the reminder." Don, that is so sweet. That is very sweet. Isn't it? He actually oh set it up. Oh my goodness. So oh, that, he set it up. So that the, the Gibson library page reminds him of stuff. Wow. That now, where sweet. does Don live? In uh, Long Island, New York. If Don ever comes here, he must tell us. It's beautiful. Yes. Very, very beautiful. Absolutely. Come on. Uh, our friend Dave Martin, who works for our favorite food company, donated money to us. Congratulations to you, too. Enjoy this small gift for your wedding. I'm so happy for both of you. He said this a while back. Yes. But it, it something happened and it didn't go through. So David Martin, thank you very much for doing that. Thank That's you, Dave. Wonderfully sweet of you so to sweet. do that. Very sweet. Uh, our friend Roddy Paws says I've been using the official Twitter I think I've already read this one before. Using the official Twitter client for the Mac until the day it stopped working. I'm one of the few who liked and preferred it. Would still be using it. I'd like to find a client that's close to it as possible. I've been trying Twitter Twitterific. I don't like it. What client would you recommend? Unfortunately, I think I said this before, Roddy. I I, I like the uh, Twitterific client. The only other thing I suggest would be Tweetbot or maybe TweetDeck. Um, if anyone has any other suggestions, let me know. I, I use Twitterific on the Mac and on the on iOS. We also got a $25 donation from uh, Christopher Bross. Just wanted to throw a little love your way. Thank, Thank you very you, much, Christopher. To Christopher, for that. I appreciate that. That's very kind. Uh, I think that's it for the show tonight. I want to say thanks, as always, to our good friend Jim Downpour from The Loop at loopinsight.com uh, for being here on the show. Thanks to you guys being tuned in, whether you're listening live or listening in via the archive. Uh, we'll try to get Melissa back on the show because I don't want this Beauty and the Beast thing. I want. <laughs> oh, that's what I wanted to do. I, I was showing. Um, do, 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 what did I do with that? That is do, such do. a beautiful photograph. Oh, my goodness. Talking about composition um, before. And this is a, a great example of. Ah, stop it. Why are you doing that? Don't, don't do that, Roddy. Such a great example of um, composition in, in photography. This is uh, in the uh, Dolomite Mountains <clears throat> in Italy, northern Italy. And this is one of those things where you you got to stop and take this picture. You just absolutely have to. Uh. But look at the composition of it. You the, what's what's in the center of the frame? Nothing important. Nothing. But look at these lines that draw your eyes through. Look at that light. This is sunrise or sunset. Um, this wonderful, beautiful little church down here at at the bottom of, of the image. This is a beautiful picture. It's beautiful. But I can't stop looking at it. This is also the kind of picture that anybody can take. Yes. This is this could be an can't iPhone picture. This is probably an iPhone picture. This is the kind of picture you, you find when you're looking at your surroundings. Mm -hmm. When you're paying attention to what's going on around you, this is an easy picture to take mm -hmm. if you just pay attention to what's going on around you. I got a couple others here that I really wanted to show you guys. I absolutely love this photo because this is such a perfect example of composition. Hmm. A lot of beginners would focus on her and cut this shot off there. But because of these arches at the top of, of this 
this uh, column, you've got to include these arches. Oh, the architecture. Do not wild, cut beautiful. off arches wow. like this. Yes, she is small in the shot, but she's dead center. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. This, again, is an easy image to take. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it might be hard from the point of view of, can you get to this space with no other tourists well, around? Well, I don't know how they did that. That's what I... This might be an early morning thing or something along those lines. But that being said, if you can get this empty crew... The other thing about it is this picture requires that person to be in it. Because by having the person in the shot, you give a sense of scale of the shot. Oh, she gives it perspective with, entirely. With, without the person, I don't know how high that ceiling is but with her you instantly can see that's mm -hmm. 40 50 feet high and i can feel her awe of it but interesting monty says would be great if she didn't have that camera handbag oh, strap yeah, i kind of like the camera but that's that's me yeah, i, I kind of like that this okay. is a, but it's i understand part of the story I, isn't I, it monty yes, don't I you think, think i think it's part of the story but i understand what monty is saying with that one um this is another great shot this is in uh, in, in in tuscany and this is another shot that all you have to do is get up in the morning in Tuscany. Mm. Just get your ass out of bed at 5 a.m., oh, yeah. sit down somewhere, and this is going to happen. There's oh. something about the light in Tuscany. Oh, I, I have do to get not up know why. very, very, very early in Tuscany all but the time. That happens every single morning yeah. in Tuscany. It's wild how easy it is to get these images in in tuscany these trees these, these cypress trees are common everywhere so this the, these lines that you're looking through these little well, farm it's the houses. contours of the uh the geography as yes, well yes exactly it's not flat <coughs> it's rolling and the light hits all of the hills it's and it's absolutely spectacular you you can't help but get these kind of images when you go to places like that they're easy to get uh one of the other shots that i love this shot this is in um lisbon and this is a, a, a view, again, the leading lines, this line of the, the buildings and, and, and the subway cars. Mm -hmm. Stevie Wonder could take this picture. Mm -hmm. you know, this is one of those things where if you're wandering around looking at your surroundings, you're paying attention to what's going on around you, you will get this picture. Mm -hmm. This is not a hard picture to get. No. And because this is on Instagram, it's probably an iPhone shot. Probably, yes. Yes, absolutely. It's not hard to get. Beautiful images, especially when you're paying attention and looking around. Here's another one of those beautiful Tuscan shots. Not quite so as beautiful as the other one. I, lo I love this one, though. I like this one more because there's more of that sense of these lines mm. and because of the person mm -hmm. in the center here. I, l I actually like the – you're right. The, the lighting isn't as good. doesn't have the feel for me as the yeah. other light. The lighting isn't as good. I, 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 the composition, I think, is better. Yeah, right. Yes, yes. And I'm, one of the reasons why, what else? Um, doo -doo -doo, some other shot that I got of. Uh, this is just some of my favorites from uh, from Instagram. Well, of course, my look at my favorites. <laughs> um, <coughs> the reason the reason why I, I brought this up is because because uh, Melissa and I are going to be in Lisbon, Portugal. March 22nd to March 31st. And we want you guys to join us. Yes, we absolutely. are planning on a... Uh, I tried this a couple of years ago. I'm going to try it again. We're planning on a uh, photo tourism trip to Lisbon, Portugal. One of the most beautiful cities I've ever seen photographically. photographically. Uh, inexpensive. Beers are two bucks a piece. Um, the idea is to spend seven days in Portugal. We will have classes four days out of the seven. There will be classes on composition, on uh, portraiture, on um, black and white and street photography and landscape photography. The idea would be that we're going to meet in the mornings and do a little half an hour, 45 minute theory of these kind of things. And then we're going to go out and actually do them. We're going to go out and shoot portraits. We're going to go out and shoot landscape. We're going to go out and shoot street and black and white for a couple hours. And then you're free to go off and do whatever you want. Go and, and go see the Azuleos. Go shopping. Go to the museums. Hang out with Melissa. Hang out I. with us. Look, MacMan wants to come. You, this is one of those things that um, 
Oh, shut up, Siri. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is, before we had a company called Finisterra Travel set it up, and it was very, very expensive. It was $3,500 US. Okay, that was hugely expensive. I'm trying to get it. If anyone knows a travel agent or a travel company or a tour operator, get them in touch with me, please, because this is driving me nuts. But I have found tickets from Vancouver for a week in Lisbon, airfare, hotel, airfare, what else? Airfare and hotel. Mm -hmm. Airfare hotel for about 1500 bucks Canadian. Mm. Airfare hotel, $1,500 Canadian. From Vancouver. So if you're anywhere east of us, <laughs> if, really? you're, if you're in Toronto, oh. you're, you, 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 if you're in Toronto, you're guaranteed to save $400. That's how much it costs to fly from Vancouver to freaking Toronto. And remember, Portugal's cheap. Portugal itself is cheap. The food is inexpensive. Mm. The booze is inexpensive. Um, traveling around is, 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 is I've inexpensive. I've never heard anything bad about no. Portugal or Lisbon. Um, so if you can, if you're looking to fly to New York, I've seen travel deals on on travel websites out of New York for seven nights airfare hotel for under a thousand dollars. So you can get there for under fifteen hundred bucks if you're outside of Vancouver. You can, then got to pay us to entertain your asses for a week. Um, but think about it. It's it's for those of folks who um, I don't know about March break. One of the one of the reasons why we're doing it in that time frame is because Melissa. Um, her March break uh, for her job and for also for uh, Rory is that two weeks around that March 22nd period of time. So that's why we're going. The weather won't be hot. It won't be touristy. That's the thing for me. I will not go to Europe in general. In gen it's before in, in the big yeah. season starts. Won't go to Europe in general in June, July, and August. A, it's stinking hot. B, Even it's May. full of tourists. Mm. And C, a lot of places are shut down. A lot of places, for example, in France, shut down for August. Like everyone goes on vacation. Why would they do that? It's a busy it's, season. It's, it's tradition. The, the French get 30 days off vacation, and they all bugger off in August. Oh, because, of, oh, you mean not if they have smart. a touristy place as a business. Oh, no, exactly, as a business. So um, uh, late to mid-March temperatures are between uh, upper 50s, lower 60s, highs. And, and mid to lower 50s in the evening. So it's not cold. It's a little cool. Uh, but a lot fewer tourists. And because it's not tourist season, everything will be a lot cheaper, too. Uh, Monty says, ping me this weekend. Let me talk to a travel agent. Because mm -hmm. that's, that's what we need. I want to be able to find a travel agent where people can, where people can just say, um, hey, I'm with the Sean group. And they'll go, oh, okay, done. You're going to stay at this hotel and this kind of thing. Mm. Um, because trying to do it on your own is a, is a pain. But it's also so we know people are coming. And once you pay the travel agent, then, then they'll say, hey, you know, Monty's mm. coming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you're interested and you want more details, uh, go to startingpointphotography.com. Send me an email. I'll send you the details. I post it up on a Facebook page. Uh, you've got a lot of time to think about it, a lot of time to save up. We've got... June, July, August, mm. October, November, December, January, February. Ten months. I wonder if Monty, um, what sort of flights Monty could get. Out of Atlanta? He'd love to go, oh, he says. Shit, but he Monty? doesn't know that he can afford it. So, yeah, Monty, ten months. Uh, Monty, I can guarantee you, you can probably get direct flights out of Atlanta. Do you think you could? Oh, God, yes. Direct Come on. To, Atlanta's uh, the busiest airport in, in North America. If not the Atlanta? world. Atlanta? Oh, yeah. Sorry, oh, Monty. God, yes. Really? Yeah. Wow. Atlanta is insane in the world. The world? Oh, yeah. my God. Atlanta, Why, oh. though? Uh, odd. Be yeah, a busiest airport in, 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 in oh, the world. Oh, Monty, you should look at what it might cost. But Mac Man's very interested. Ooh, it, yeah, Shanghai it's, is catching up. It's guaranteed to be fun. I mean, if nothing else, you get to hang out with us. For, it would be fun. For We'd while. all take photographs and sit around and look at our photographs and enjoy ourselves. And it's beautiful. And the ocean is there, right? Yes. And there's all kinds of excursions you you, you know you can go on too. You, you don't have to stick with us the the, the entire time. Uh, no, there'll be all no, kinds no. of time to do to do your own thing. To do too. your own thing if you want. Uh, to. Whether it's shopping or museums or just hanging out or going to the beach or whatever. The, the idea is that every afternoon from noon on. 
you off and doing whatever it is that, that you want to do. Mm-hmm. And then in the evenings, well, we'll meet up. And, hey, we're going to meet up at this restaurant yeah. and listen to Fado and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but classes four days out of, out of the seven. And then, like I said, if you want to hang out with Melissa and I while we do that. And hopefully we're going to be in Florence the week before. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be our honeymoon, finally. <laughs> without small children. <laughs> that's going to be a big deal. Oh, we deal. can finally consummate this marriage. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Nice. <laughs> nice. Got 10 more months to wait. Um, I'm seeing uh, on kayak, Monty, um, 1300 bucks flight and hotel Canadian. So let's take that in U.S. dollars. Wow. Um, flight and hotel out of Atlanta, Georgia, 1000 bucks. So. Flight and hotel. But then we'd all want to make sure we were staying close well, or well, together. That's or, why I want a travel agent was so yeah. that the travel agent could say, here's a good hotel that's in the Alfama district and you can all stay in the same okay, hotel. Okay, that would be nice. Because that's the goal. Yes, you can go and find your own deal if that's what you want. Mm. But a travel agent is almost guaranteed to be able to get you a better deal than you can personally for a group. Mm. The other thing is, is I found out how much work do you want to put in Saving 20 bucks. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. spent at least 20 hours over the past two weeks trying to figure out various permutations of he really has. the travel. And it's dro- driven me nuts. <laughs> it's very funny that, and you can do it. You can find a cheap flight. I found flights from, Van- and this is, this is the itinerary, Vancouver to Toronto, Toronto to London Heathrow Airport, London Heathrow Airport to Florence, Florence to Lisbon, Lisbon to London, London, Toronto, Toronto, Vancouver. <laughs> now, that's cheaper if you do that as, as single legs of trips. It's bizarre. But then it's scary to just go ahead and book all that exactly. if you're not a travel agent. Exactly. If you're not a travel agent. If you get one of the timing wrong, you're I mean, screwed. You're screwed. Um, it's, it's, it, Kale is very OCD. He loves doing research. Oh, good. I lo- yeah. you got to be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> If, if you're a trap. So anyway, cool if, name, if, if you want more information, uh, we got 10 months to plan this thing. And yeah. I really, I really and hope. Susan, look, Susan says it, the price was this. Susan's got to come too. From ca- California. Uh, Mike oh, Man yeah. says, um, Mac Man, I could save three. Yeah, because we're here in Vancouver. The, the You can't get more, from a flying perspective, more backwater than Vancouver. Because we're a major um, airport. But going east, yeah. everything's out of Every, Toronto. Yeah, that's right. Every flight has to stop in Toronto. And from Toronto, you can get direct flights to Lisbon. In the States, you can go, even if you're in Nashville, you can go from Nashville to Atlanta, Atlanta, Lisbon. If you're in the New York area, New York, Lisbon. So there's all kinds of um, things. To, yeah, we're to definitely that. at a disadvantage. Yeah, we're right definitely, de- de- definitely at a disadvantage here. But like I said, 1500 bucks is generally the price I'm finding for flights and hotel out of vancouver so it's going to be cheaper for everybody who isn't in vancouver to be able to fly so so and that's canadian what is hey siri 1500 dollars canadian is what u.s which rebels all miss rebels Elaine is hey siri rebels, rebels game in u.s god damn it i hate siri shut up siri she's been ignoring him these days everyone Fifteen hundred dollars Canadian to U.S. is eleven hundred bucks U.S. So eleven hundred bucks U.S. That's the most they're going to pay. And I'm, that's I'm, a week there, a week flight yeah. return with your accommodation. So again, uh, if you have you, you have any more in, in information, uh, send me uh, emails to Sean at yourmaclifeshow dot com. Until next week, as always, I've been Sean King. I'm Melissa King. And you've been listening to, you, you mm-hmm. zoned out there for a second, didn't well, you? Well, I'm reading what, what reading? Um, uh, Susan's saying. They're going to Europe next. Oh, good. Yeah, uh, to uh, Italy, Italy, sorry. Cool. Uh, and you've been listening to Your <laughs> Mac Life. See ya. <laughs> Bye.